Hi guys, welcome to Mentorship Mondays. Um, let's see who's with us today. Gonna give it a little bit of time, give an opportunity for some of us to jump on. Uh, Terry, hello to you. Uh, is it Tangi or Tangi? Hello to you. Pute, Pute Humpo, Ntebo, hello, hello, hello. Um, Evie's here and Mrs. M Unati is here. Guys, please let me know where you're joining us from. I love to see where the conversation has reached and um, where everyone's joining us from. I'm literally just stretching for water. Um, I am Tony. Hello to you, Noxy. Oh, by the way, uh, Avetandwa, this is the first time you're not the first person on, so I'm wondering if Avetandwa is with us today. But Avetandwa has consistently been the first person on the calls for like forever. Khuitsi, always representing um, Botswana. I can't wait to come back to Khabarone. Maybe we can uh, maybe just have a, a coffee. Uh, Thick, Thick says, I'm also from Botswana. Um, Uemitle. Is that how I say your name? That's such a beautiful name. Avetando, I was just talking about you. Welcome. Mum says, I'm in London. Um, Mrs. M says, hey, I'm in Durban. Um, we're coming soon. We're coming soon. Avetando says, no, I was the first. <laughs> we'll check. We'll see. Um, but you allowed others to join. Terry says, hey, I'm in Kenya. Balentle, where are you? Tell us where you are. Karabo, hello to you. Ah, guys, it is so hot in Johannesburg. So I am Tony Musikili. I think you're probably uh, with me on that one. Um, Notando says, I'm finally joining from Instagram. Hi, Nozi. I'm in Durban. Hello, Derbs. Um, uh, oh, Emile, what a beautiful name. Sure. Um, Tammy, hello. Nice to see you, my sis. Uh, uh, Kay, hello to you. Um, and then we've got someone in Da'ar in the Northern Cape. What's the weather like in the Northern Cape, guys? I always just think it must be hot all the time. Um, my other sister, uh, Lira, Dira, my lovely Rato, that's my sister. Um, welcome, Rato. Okay, and we've had in KZN as well. So, Kuliso, hello to you and Zukit and others and others and others and others and others. Happy Mentorship Monday. It is the second uh, one this year um and we are keeping our foot firmly on the pedal i wanted to say firstly thank you so much for sending me your questions we've got um some good questions that have come through today that we're going to work through now guys remember right that you have to, you are the ones who drive this conversation by sending us your questions it's the same as if you had a one-on-one -on -one, a physical relationship with the mentor um you've got to be the one who's driving uh, that relationship by constantly, you know, asking, um, putting the challenges that you have on the table. So your mentor can either find some answers for you or refer you to people who they think might be better suited to actually respond to those questions. So to the extent that you are sending the questions, that's how we are emulating and really tapping into making this an authentic experience that is driven by your real challenges, questions you really want to um, come up with. It's not a motivation session, guys. So sometimes maybe we get motivated along the way, but that's not our intent. The intent is not to come here and, um, and rah, rah, give you motivation and fire you up. I mean, go to church for that, right? Get the word of God and, you know, get all of that. This is about working through some stuff together right figuring out some of the big opportunities to clear uh some of the questions um and things standing in your way so that we can all make progress and remember if i don't have the answer i'm going to find somebody uh who's going to have the answer and i'm going to invite that person to come and join us on mentorship mondays because nobody actually has all the answers myself included all right so i'm wangui i'm assuming that you're in uh kenya um, but I, I, I am saying, let me know where you are. If you are uh, in Kenya, if you're in South Africa, any other country, let us know. So I want to get into some of the questions. All right. So Mpo sent us a question and Mpo Madala. Mpo says, um, Nozi, when you're planning an exit or resignation um, to start your own business, what are the things that are often overlooked? 
guys i feel like we've had this conversation so many times so i want to firstly apologize if i'm gonna bore anyone of you because we've had this conversation about the jump the exit from business or sorry the exit from uh corporate um from a full-time stable job to actually running your own business right um and what I've always done is I've typically always just shared my story because I think one of the most powerful things is that we learn from each other's stories. We don't learn from theory. You know, there's no point for me saying, you know, I once read one, two, three, four, five. And then if one, two, three, four, five has never been practiced in my life, that doesn't mean anything. I've got to give you the rawness of, look, this is how I went about it. Um, this is what worked. This is what didn't work. These were my fears. This is how I overcame my fears. And I really hope that that um, is helpful. So I'm maybe going to start off in a different way than I usually start in relation to this particular question. The first thing is that I think it's important that as you move from corporate, uh, from working for someone to start your own business, that you also look at what is currently an asset in the corporate environment that is available to you to leverage in your business. I think sometimes when we exit or we resign, we often do it because we've come to a point where, not because we're excited about the business opportunity, um, and excuse my French, but we're hurtful of where we are. So we're done with where we are. We don't like the environment, we don't like the boss, or we don't like the work. And we forget to appreciate what is in the corporate environment that is really working well that you can take into your business and tweak it so that it fits your business and build on that skill or build on that client base or build on those relationships or build on those networks. So I always say before you leave, make sure that you've taken full stock of what you already have to start off with. And sometimes it's not something tangible, but sometimes it's just something, it's a skill, it's a mindset, it's an attitude. And you ask yourself, how am I going to use and build on this as I take my next journey? Remember, every single place that you've been is a preparation for where you're still, a preparation for where you're headed to. So let me say that again. Every single place where you've been is preparation for where you're headed to. One of the things that I always speak about is that we must remember that as human beings, we're like um, a river. And a river is the sum total of all the places that it's been. A river is not just the sum total of having come through that particular village or down that particular stream. It's right from its source. Everywhere that it's been, where you meet a river, that is the sum total of where it's been. In the same way, use the sum total of what you've been exposed to, including also the bad experiences you might have had in corporate, and turn those into an asset that you're going to take into your business. Now, on a practical level, so that's an attitudinal um, thing to do. It's about adjusting your mindset and your attitude as you make way and you take the step of jumping to the next thing. From a practical experience perspective, my biggest fear was, is my business going to generate enough income for me to cover my salary, but more importantly, to cover my debit orders? That's, it. That's what it boils down to, money in versus debit orders. And the beautiful thing about debit orders is that they can be moved. They can be massaged. You can downgrade. You can let some things go. And that's exactly what I did, right? Um, that's exactly what I did. I just decided to let go of certain things that would allow me to bring my cost of living down so that I could minimize the risk that was associated with taking this leap of faith of starting my own business. So the way I minimized the risk is I moved. I actually moved out of my own place I put my own place up for rent because I realized I was going to get more rental income from that place and then moved into a cheaper place. And net net, I was making more money from that decision on its own. I was also ready um, and I gave myself three months to say, if in three months I'm not making my salary as expected, what I am going to do is I'm going to trade in my car. So at the time I was driving a Mercedes Benz C-Class and I just thought I was the thing and I was just like okay cool I'm going to um I'm gonna trade in my car 
And God being God, I didn't have to do that, but I was prepared to do that. So the first thing is the equation between your, your costs and your, and your projected income has to make sense. Guys, my poor dog is knocking at the door and he's been in hospital all day. Let me just, please give me a second. Let me open for him, Shem, just one second. Okay, I'm back. Hey, you got a full view on my tummy as well. Um, yeah, shame he's been in hospital. He had to go get his um, some teeth extracted. So he's just wanting to be around his mom today. So the, the equation of your costs versus your income just has to make sense. And the only way that's going to make sense is if you downgrade um, some of your costs while you wait for your projections to come through. The assumption that I've made is that you've done your calculations based on your projections. Where do you think the money is going to come from? Why do you think you're going to have so many customers? And so it's always a good idea to have some sort of testing of the waters of checking in with people to say, if I had this to sell, would you be, would you be keen to buy it? And if you were keen to buy it, what would you, would you be comfortable with paying, play, paying such a particular price and then just making your extrapolations to say how many of these products or services am I going to have to sell in a month in order to cover those costs, right? Um, Hoiti says, uh, often it's because we are frustrated by the job. I like the leveraging the space we want to leave, especially the network. It's reminding me of Lungile Tabes. Lungi Letabete's story when leaving Mr. Price. Absolutely, Hoitze. And if I remember that story cor correctly, um, as Lungila was leaving Mr. Price, um, she then tendered in her resignation and they said, actually, no, don't. We'd rather partner with you. So imagine if you were able to do that really well and your current employer then sees you as a partner um, or they become a client of yours so that um, you're not losing the relationship but you're actually building on everything that you've had up until that point. So let me pause there. I always tell the story of um, one of the first things you've got to do about re resigning or exited a, exiting a business, um, um, a, a, a corporate for a business, is that I'm assuming you've done the work of facing the fear of not making money and all of that. And then remember some of the, I think some of the biggest mistakes, and I could maybe share a few of my own, is that we're sometimes really afraid um, to hire people too quickly because you're like, what am I going to pay them with? And it's such a hard trade-off because on the one hand, you want to hire people because the, if you hire really good team members, they allow you to realize your vision very quickly and allow you to produce the product or an asset at the level that you want very quickly. But you can't put the cart before the horse. You've got to start making money first before you start hiring people to get a sense of what your overall headcount costs might be. And so it's always better to always factor in, depending on the business, whether you're going to need people or not and how much you're going to need to pay people. Okay. This guy who I thought was missing me has now left me and is outside again. Anyway, that's fine. So, Mpo, um, thank you for the question. Um, I talk about this question a lot, so I don't want to spend too much time because I think it's one of those questions where, you know, I could go on and on for over an hour just talking about it because it's such a, an important question. I would also maybe say go and watch the previous uh, Mentorship Mondays, which are on our YouTube channel and we will, and you can pick up on that question because uh, we've spoken about it at length. Um, I thought, um, so I got a, a question from somebody who calls themselves um, More Love Natural Hair. Okay, so that's the handle. Unfortunately, I don't have the name. And More Love Natural Hair says, Sis, I love your brand. Thank you so much. Um, how do I cultivate deep self-belief um, and get around powerful women. So I was really challenged by this question because I was like, what does it mean to get around powerful women? How, what does it mean to get around powerful women? Does it mean, um, how to hold your own when you're in a room full of powerful women? Um, or oh, other tender says maybe it's networking with powerful women. And then also, why women? Is it harder to 
network in a room full of powerful women than it is in a network full of powerful men um and why and i was perplexed by the question because i was also like is there a gift in this question in the sense that maybe there are certain things i'm trying i'm looking I'm like, i hope you guys can still see me um is there a thing is there a gift in the question that we're missing that maybe as women who are considered powerful in certain spaces that we are difficult to be around and that's why i just thought i love this question because it's a question of self-reflection and so i'm not just speaking to the women um on this particular mentorship monday but i'm also going to speak to uh the men because i think in speaking to the men as well you also have women that you're leading and perhaps this is a conversation that might be useful for them so the first question for all of us to think about is what might make it difficult or what might make people lose their confidence and self-esteem when they enter a room of powerful women and i'm going to take powerful to mean women in positions of power okay so i'm talking about authority i'm talking about senior women and i think it's a brilliant question because oftentimes in order for women to rise through the ranks and to occupy the spaces that get them to be considered as powerful women, they become pseudo men. So when I mean pseudo men, I mean they become, they take on male like characteristics because especially in the corporate environment, the way that success um, and leadership looks like is often shaped by the the archetype of masculinity and oftentimes it's the archetype of white masculinity and so in order for you to want to make it and in order for you to be seen to have made it as a woman women then often take on the behaviors and the characteristics of men and white men in particular i think it's one of the saddest things that happens in women as they evolve in their leadership in the sense that we sometimes run the risk of losing who we are because we are trying to show and convince all of the those watching us that we are worthy of being of the title of leader and so we 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 take on the very things that when we look at men in leadership we don't like we become hard we become um we become we lose our compassion because we're told that if you're compassionate um you're soft and people are going to run all over you we lose our accommodation we we behave like men that don't have a sense of what home responsibility looks like right and so we don't we don't we we lose the empathy for women who have young families for women who have um, uh, just families in general, we lose the empathy for single mothers because we realize that in order for us to have made it, it was so tough that anybody else who's going to follow needs to go through the same tough route. So I'm calling out that behavior. And that's why I wanna say thank you for this question because I have seen it, but I also think there might have been instances where myself, I've taken on some very masculine like traits however because you know i'm going to heaven however i do not believe that there's any such thing as a woman type of leader and a masculine or male type of leader i think there are leaders right and that's why i always say that women can also be aggressive women can also be um calculating Women is, can also be shrewd in the same way that men can develop the capacity to be compassionate. Men can develop the capacity to be accommodative and understanding. Men be, can become nurturers and so on. So I think that this is an opportunity for all of us to think about what is the kind, not the kind of woman leader I want to be, no. What is the kind of leader that I want to be full stop? 
because it matters how people experience you as a leader. You're either going to be the leader who shuts people down when they, when you walk into a room, you're going to be a leader that minimizes people when you step into um, a, a room. Um, you can also be the kind of leader that makes people feel small. I want to pin this comment. And so it's important for us to be mindful to say, when I step into the room, what is the experience that I want of people to have with me? Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every time you step into a room as a leader, you must be liked and you must be the nicest one. You must be the kindest one. I know I'm not as a start, right? I'm not saying that. I'm saying we must be conscious of the choice we have about how we show up. So I was in an interview earlier on today where I was being interviewed and I was making this a very example and I was saying that I'm okay um, for people to dislike me because I ask difficult questions of them, of their work, of their purpose, where they're going. And so I have a tendency to put people in a space of discomfort because I'm going to ask the question. Now, if as a leader that makes me unliked to a certain extent because I'm stretching, I'm challenging my team and others that I work with, that's okay, but I'm conscious of it. And so I know that I will lose team members who don't want to grow. I know that I will lose team members who are afraid to try new, big, bold things, right? And I'm conscious of that and I'm okay with that. And so in the same way, in the same way, it's not about being liked, but it's about being deliberate about, this is the experience that I want people to have of me as a leader. And this is, and this is how I'm going to cultivate that experience. And whether some people like it and some people don't like it, that's also fine. And if I am a woman, I am going to be extra conscious of it because I know that there is this tendency or this, uh, um, the, this preceding behavior that we've seen of women who become men when they arrive at leadership positions and to be conscious about not becoming a man on your way there. So, uh, Lyra says, I do think if it goes unchecked, one can easily and unconsciously take on that mask. Absolutely agreed. It's a mask that people tend to hide behind because it's a mask that gives people the, the impression that you're hard, you're tough, and you are a leader. And yes, leaders can be hard and tough, but can, they can also be compassionate. They can also be understanding. It depends on the context. There isn't one leadership style for every single context. There are moments where you have to be an absolute hardcore military sergeant to get the job done. And there are times where you have to be soft and, and nurturing to be able to really understand what's going on with your team. The difference is, do you know what your team requires of you in different moments? And are you conscious of the experience they're having of you? And more importantly, that you don't become a diminisher of people's dreams because you're blindly walking in and out of spaces as a leader, trampling on people's voices, shutting them down, trampling on their dreams, all because you're trying to prop yourself up to be seen as a leader. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just, I'm just putting it um, out there. And that's more love natural hair there who was sharing that with us. So I thought it was a great question. Um, um, I know that maybe the answer or the reflection I've given wasn't what you had intended, but I do think that it's, um, it's an important place for us to start before we interrogate um, others and their leadership styles. Have you interrogated your own? Oh, Real Duchess says you just described Jessica from the bold type. Oh, I, I haven't seen that in a long time. Is Jessica the, um, the, 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 the boss with the blonde hair, the one who dresses so nicely, um, the older one who has the husband, the stay-at-home husband? Please let me know. Because I was so vested in that, um, <laughs> in, that, in that show. Please just remind me which one is Jessica. Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Tabi Singh says, I become a, a man when I become a leader. It backfired as I, beca I became a man when I became a leader. It backfired as they experienced me differently to how they knew me. 
until I had to do an emotional intelligence course, which forced me to do some self-reflection. Sure. Thank you. So thank you for that authentic uh, share. Um, Lyra says, they call it being assertive to take away the guilt for lack of a better word. No, assertive doesn't mean mean, guys. Um, so thank you for raising that as well. All right. Um, I want to take on the next question. All right. So the next question comes from um, Tembi. I think it's Silet or Silet, Tembi. So you'll forgive me if, I, if I've got this wrong. Um, and Tembi says, okay, let's just start with one question, Nozi. It's the beginning of the year. Many of us want to get mentors. Um, how to approach a mentor when you have no social capital? Guys, you know, I've got people who like exposing me here. Um, it's Cairns. It's like, hello, Bridge. Now, Candice, you want to expose me that my other name is Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to school with Candace. Um, uh, <laughs> I went to school with Candace, um, and it's such a long story. Maybe I'll tell you at the end. But reclaiming your name um, is such an important thing as a black person. And I think many of us have stories of how we might have once had white names um, and then claimed, um, and then went back to you know to the names that. Um, the names that we were given at birth. So hopefully I'll get to that. But thank you, Candice, for reminding me. Um, Real Duchess, yes, it's Jacqueline. That's it. Blonde hair, absolutely. You're 100% um, you on it. Um, so Tembi is saying, how do, you approach, um, how do you approach a mentor, especially when you have no social capital? Okay. So before I go there, Kay, let me quickly read your comment. Um, Kay is saying, I was a head girl back at school and the responsibility of leading all grade, eight grades of the school required me to put my personality aside and step into the character of being a leader. Okay, let's talk about how do you approach a mentor, especially when you have no social capital. So let me start here. Let me start with being controversial first. Just be controversial up front. So let's start there. First and foremost, everybody has social capital there is no scenario where you have zero social capital because what is social capital social capital is the worth of your relationships and for you to have no social capital means that you've invested zero in every single relationship that you've ever had and the problem why we sometimes come up with that belief that we have zero social capital is that we don't value the social capital of some relationships and we think only certain relationships can hold capital. We think only professional relationships hold capital. We think that being able to network with powerful or well-known people um, is what gives you social capital. We forget that we've got social capital in the community we come from. We've got social capital from the church that we're in, the relationships we nurture there. We give there all the time. And I'm not talking giving financially, but you're giving of yourself. I would hope that there's something that you're doing, whether it's in your church or any other voluntary, volunteering space um, that you're, you're giving into. You've got social capital amongst your family. Um, there are relationships that you're investing in, in one way or the other. So I just want to dispel firstly that thought that there's a scenario where you have no social capital. We all have social capital. The question is, are you valuing all your forms of social capital? Or are you putting certain people on a pedestal and therefore assuming that only when you have a relationship with them does that translate into, a social, into social capital? Sidebar, sidebar. Um, somebody, says, um, somebody said to me uh, before that... When we put people on, on pedestals, it's just um, a reflection of our own fear of where we think we should be. Just sleep on that. I just thought that was super powerful. When you put somebody on a pedestal, it's just a reflection or a mirror of your own fear of where you think you should be. So you'd rather put somebody else there because that's where you think you, be, you, you should be at this moment. Anyway, so how do you approach person? How do you approach a person with whom you have no social capital? 
That I can understand. So let's talk about that. How do you approach a mentor with whom you have no social capital? So you don't know the person from a bar of soap, right? And you want this person to mentor you. Now, again, guys, please, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not trying to be facetious and trying to be mean. I have a real profound issue with people believing that the most powerful mentors are mentors because they are bright shining stars who've been on magazine covers, who've done amazing things, who are out there. They are big names. And therefore, you have no relationship or contact with that person whatsoever. And, and then you begin to seek to have a relationship with them. And the easiest way to do that is to begin to say, okay, I want a mentorship relationship. There's nothing wrong with aspiring towards that. But I, t I, see, I tend to find that those are the most inauthentic mentor-mentee relationships. You have, to, you have to almost come back and say, in selecting a mentor, who do I know who probably knows me as well, and I'll tell you why, who would be willing to invest their time and their energy in a mentorship relationship with me? The reason why I say that it needs to preferably be somebody who knows you is that people back people who back themselves. Every mentor that I have ever come across is absolutely ignited when they come across people who are backing themselves in the first instant, in the first instant. And so it's always really um, helpful to approach somebody who has some line of sight of the work that you're doing for yourself already. And that in itself is social capital to be able to showcase that this is what I'm doing. And the reason I'm asking you to be a mentor to me is to help me break through on a particular issue around something that I'm doing. I'm not asking you to be a mentor just because you're famous or you're powerful or you're, you've, you're on magazine covers and you're this and you're that. And I think that is a really good place to start. Um, you, it, it's, and, and it doesn't have to be somebody who you've invested anything in half the time, the people that we are wanting to mentor us, we often think that we've got nothing to invest in them. But I do think that it's not about you having invested in them, but it is somebody who can at the very least have an observable record of what you're doing for yourself. People, mentors are attracted to mentees who've already bought into their own story, who are already backing themselves up and the mentor-mentee relationship becomes an opportunity to break through to the next level. Um, Huita says, um, authenticity, is a, authentic, authenticity in a mentor-mentee relationship, a topic to further unpack in one of the sessions. Maybe let's touch on it, Huita, because I think it's very important. So we've already spoken about how we're not, in 2023, going to be approaching mentors just because they're famous, right? We're not just going to be approaching people just because we've seen them on covers or they've got they are, they are the, the trend of the moment, right? We're not doing that. We're looking for people in the industry that we're playing in, um, or if they're not in the industry, but there's something about the industry that, you, that they're in that you think if you could learn from them, you can extrapolate some of those insights to be able to have impact in your industry. So you can cross-pollinate their industry insights into your industry but preferably it's somebody in your industry, somebody who's seen you, observed you, um, and has, has a reason to bank on you, has a reason to take out risk capital on you. Because remember, for every, for every hour that a mentor is spending in that relationship, it's an investment on their part as well. Now, here's the thing about investments. People also all want to get something out. No, nobody wants to invest for investment's sake. So people back you because they know that what they're getting out at the very least is a legacy that that person, you, are a product of their mentorship and their work. So you've got to be investable. You've got to be bankable, right? And if you're not investable, you're not bankable, and all you have is that I, I, I admire you, that's not good enough, right? It's just not good enough. It's just, it just doesn't cut it anymore, okay? So let's talk about authenticity in those relationships. So 
as you guys know, I not only mentor, but I get mentored as well. The power of I don't know in a mentor mentee relationship is probably one of the most important things. And that's the, the, that answer coming from your mentor is also an opportunity for you to both show up with vulnerability and then look for opportunities to find solutions and pathways. One of the biggest gifts my mentor that I had last year gave to me is I was struggling with a very real issue professionally. Um, and she said to me, Nozi, I don't know what the answer is. Um, but what I can do is that I'm going to um, introduce you to, and the lady she introduced to me to was Wendy Mahoney. She says, I'm going to introduce you to Wendy. And I think that Wendy is going to be the best person um, to guide you through what it is that you are struggling with. Now, imagine if we didn't have that authenticity where my mentor felt that every time I came to her with a thing, she had to have an answer. And also, if I didn't have a level of authenticity to put down a real issue, there's nothing more tiring than tired questions, right? Um, and uh, there's, I can't say that enough. There's nothing more tiring than tired questions because they are a reflection that you're either not applying yourself or you're actually not as invested in your own growth and development as you'd like other people to believe you are. And so she introduced me to Wendy. I had a quick chat, probably 30 minute conversation with Wendy who then said, oh no, 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 I'm not the person to help you, but I know exactly the person you should be talking to. And Wendy introduced me to Lisa and Lisa today is my coach, right? And Lisa and I have had a relationship now, I think we're going for about seven or eight months. Now, that is the power of authenticity and vulnerability. You, you get to where you need to, you get to your breakthrough person. Because your breakthrough person is at the other end of, of real authentic sharing and not sh coming up and performing a relationship that is wasting your time and wasting the other person's time as well. Okay, so I hope that helps. Tembi, thank you for the question. Abitanda, I pinned your comment because you said people no longer want relationships with people around them. They, oops, they mostly want to network with famous people. I feel like we're... Um, I feel like we're missing living life in the moment. Uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know what this obsession with fam famous people is, guys, um, but hopefully it's a, it's a trend that will pass. I wanted to pick up um, a comment. I think it's Khoise. Khoise saying, mentors can be seasonal. You learn, you share, you grow, then you move. <sighs> We've spoken about this, guys, but I won't get into it because I've got three other questions I want to speak to you about. And I still want to tell you my story of being called Bridget Tough, my life. Um, but I just wanted to say, there's an article that I wrote for Destiny magazine when they went online a long time ago, but it was called um, The Kitchen Cabinet, I think. And in that article, I was talking about the courage to fire your mentor. Please go read it. Let me know what you think, because I think the answer is, is exactly there. Sometimes... Sometimes you really need to be able to understand that all relationships, including mental mentor mentee relationships are seasonal and that sometimes you need to be able to fire your current mentor and move on to the next because they're no longer serving the purpose of why you hired them in the first place for a particular part of your journey. Your journey and its trajectory has changed. It requires different sorts of skills and attitudes um, different type of muscle and if your mentor is no longer suited for that it's time to move on the best mentors by the way are the ones who fire themselves because they come to you and they tell you you no longer need my help you no longer need me I actually think you need to move on you can do this on your own and by the way when that happens and I've seen this on so many occasions when that um, um, when that happens please do not make the mistake of having umbilical cord syndrome of wanting to now be can't let go because you've created this dependency on a person that you actually no longer need part of the thing is letting go you've got to the growth is about taking what you need from that relationship and then being able to unleash that into the next phase of your growth 
you can't necessarily always be holding on to the same relationship even when it's time has passed so real duchess says i just fired mine earlier this month we need tips please real duchess how do you fire a mentor how did you fire your mentor we'd love to know okay so um La lauren lauren laura sent us a question um and lauren says i'm in a management position as a as a millennial and that means that i lead people of different age groups how does one develop the confidence to lead all the team members who may have been in the organization longer than i have so lauren thank you for a great question um i want to approach this in two ways because i've got a dual experience of this let me tell you my experience first and then i'll explain to you my two ways when i when i first joined cnbc africa 2013 i think it was and i had to start interviewing ministers and ceos and i remember 2013 is what 10 years ago right and yeah i was still in my 20s and i had to now address ministers by their first name because this is a business show you can't be um at, oh, okay maybe ministers was better because we'd still say minister and then you'd ask your question but maybe let's take a ceo somebody you um uh you you'd admire highly and somebody that you consider as a mother in the cultural sense um and having to call them by their first name so you know you'd have somebody like i don't know judy dr judy lamini and having to interview her and say judy and ask the question and the discomfort that created for me as a young black woman who was in a space where for in order for me to come across with authority with credibility I needed to overcome a cultural conditioning that I had and to be able to address people on a first name basis. So that's one. The second one is, I remember there was a time when I used to, um, when I started moderating and one of my clients was Duke University and I needed to, I was um, appointed as an orchestrator. Now what an orchestrator is, is a person basically is a facilitator. And I would be facilitating leadership sessions with executives, senior managers, and nine times out of 10, I'd be the youngest person in the room. Um, and I was tasked with facilitating and really getting these people to break through aha moments in the work or the problem that they'd come to solve as a team. And there are a couple of things that I think have been really helpful. In the television sense, in the television world where I struggled with having to come up, come overcome the cultural conditioning that it is hard for me to call elderly people by their first names, what I would just do is that before we went live, I would tell the person in advance to say, oh, by the way, um, you know, in this particular environment, I have to refer to you as your first name. Um, but just to let you know, my utmost respect, but from now on, I'm going to call you Batabile until the interview ends. Um, and it was a very hard thing for me to get over because it just wasn't the way that I was raised. But I felt that sharing that vulnerability and sharing that very real discomfort actually allowed people to give me permission to say, no, of course, please, I understand, go ahead. And the funny thing is that a lot of people were even surprised that I would share that in advance because they were so used to people just, you know, calling them by their first names. The lesson for me in that is that there is a way of acknowledging your culture and your cultural conditioning and not necessarily just losing that because you find yourself in a space that is very... Um, white culturally and so you're unable you the discomfort that comes with the way things are done is a discomfort you struggling with speak to the person um and you know say hey by the way just 
uh just a heads up i'm going to call you um you know whatever their first name is for the purposes of the interview but you know absolutely you know my that's not my go-to thing to do so that's um that's the one in the duke context where people were older than me and i needed to overcome that i needed to understand that my role the thing that was standing in my way and was creating fear and discomfort was the fact that i thought that it was important for me as a young person to prove that i was as smart as everybody else in the room and that wasn't the job as a facilitator and it's very similar to the job that i do today as a moderator i needed to learn that my job was to create pathways for people to get to their own learning and their own breakthrough and it had absolutely nothing to do with how smart i am and nobody in the room was expecting me to show up as being the smartest person in the room i had been hired because there's a spe specific skill set of enabling others to get to their own breakthrough moments which has got nothing to do with how intelligent or not intelligent i am and even to this day i've never forgotten that lesson because the people that i have on my panels live daily the realities and the questions that we're talking about i am an outsider i come in with the sole purpose of asking questions that could create disruption so that people can go oh i've never thought about it uh, that way my job is not to be the smartest person on the panel or be the smartest person in the room all of this comes down to one thing lauren and thank you for asking the question humility and it's such a hard thing for us to learn the humility to be vulnerable to say it is not in my nature to call my elders by their first names so i'm going to ask for your forgiveness in advance so that i might be able to do my job the humility on the other hand of understanding that my job is not to be the most smartest sounding person in the room but my job is to quieten my voice so that the people who are the smartest most intelligent people on the panel are heard is actually what you're being hired to do so as you think about your role leading um different people the the role that you have been given is how do you get the best out of the people that you lead it doesn't matter that they are um that it doesn't matter that they are older than you because your job is not to showcase your experience and your intellect your job is to use your ability and your skill to get people to perform at their peak and get them to do that it's a long way um to get to a simple point about the importance of humility and maybe on another day we'll talk about i say we've got 10 minutes left maybe another day we'll talk about how the word humility and the word humiliation and the word human all come from the same root which is um soil it's humus which is the same root soil and so when you when you are humble when you are steeped in humility it's because you have the ability to bring yourself down to the soil when you are humiliated is because people are decided that they're going to bring you down to the soil and as a person what when you are grounded as a person when you come when you leave this earth they say dust to dust because you are getting back into the soil it's a long story we'll speak about it but just remember you have a choice to either exercise your humility or to be humiliated towards your humility it's the same meaning but it in there in that meaning lies the choice about how do you want to come back to the soil and to stay grounded to have your feet firmly planted on the ground very conscious about who you are where you are and where you're going and not allowing whatever has gotten you to leave the soil to begin to open up the opportunity to be humiliated so that you're brought back down long story i just wanted to um real duchess says i started the conversation with thanksgiving then followed the conversation with my growth plan this is the conversation about how a real duchess um 
fired her mentor, by the way. So she started the conversation with Thanksgiving, then followed the conversation with the growth plan and how it does not align with my interest. And lastly, I led him to believe our trajectory no longer aligns. Wow, sure, beautiful. Dila, uh, thank you for your question. What's your take on having allies at work? Please DM the questions, guys, because I need to apply myself. I'm not that smart. I can't, I'm not just thinking on my feet. Please DM the questions, but maybe what we'll do in Dumiso is take Dila's question and let's push it over to next week, Monday, so that um, we don't um, miss it for the next time, because I think it's a great question. Okay, guys, I've got a few more minutes. I just wanted... Um, I wanted to share my, my, my Bridget story. <laughs> and it's so funny that it comes up. So I keep on looking at my laptop because that's where all the questions, that's where all the questions were. Um, so I don't know if I'm the only one. Please, please let me know if, by, I don't know, let me know in the comments if you have a similar story where you have an English name as well. But the long and short of it is that, guys, let's just out ourselves. What is your English name? Mine is Bridget. Like, it's okay. Just tell us what yours is. Um, and my parents named me Nozipo, Bridget. And then, of course, my maiden surname um, is Mbandra, right? And um, the reason why I was called Bridget is because of apartheid in South Africa. And that um, basically white people didn't want to be bothered uh, with um, calling people by um, their, uh, their African name. So that you needed a... a, a, a a Christian name in order to enter the school system. So Dila is Monica, Tepo is Philip, uh, and then the Mdunge is Princess. It goes on, right? So my name is Bridget. And the story goes that um, my father used to, I, I don't know about the, I mean, I don't know about the slave names thing, but I do know that in order to, um, in order to access the 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 school system because of apartheid and colonialism and all of that um we needed to have um we needed to have these uh hey francina we needed to have um these english names so my name was my second name was bridget and because i was in south africa born in south africa despite the fact that my first name is nozipo I was called Bridget in school. So they took my second name and made it my primary name. Now, the cognis cognitive dissonance that that creates in a young person is really massive and probably worth something to, um, worth thinking about. Because what, what it meant is that when I got home, I was called Nozzy, right? And when I went to school, I was called Bridget. And so from a very young age, you're taught that you don't have the privilege of a singular integrated identity. It starts off with you learning that you've got two different names and then it becomes how those two different names translate into two different behaviors and two different accents and two different ways of being. And somehow in all of that, as black people, we need to remember to remain and stay who we are. And it's such an unresearched phenomena. And that's why I thought, let me just pause for a few minutes and just speak about this. Because you are, you arrived at home and you're called Nozipo. There is an expectation that you're speaking a particular language. There's an expectation that you are showing up in a particular way, culturally respectful, um, you know, really just very different from what the expectation is when you get to the classroom, where you are Bridget, where you have to show up as smart, where you need to look people in the eye, where you need to engage in two different ways. And it creates a cognitive dissonance in young people. And it conditions us even as far as conditioning us for the world of work. Where in the world of work, we, have, we find ourselves far more easily accepting of the idea that I'm one person at work and I'm another person at home. And so when we talk about wholeness and not leaving your experiences at the door and arriving as a whole leader in the workplace, it's such a difficult thing for us to overcome 
because for as long as we could remember, we needed to be different people for different spaces that we occupied. And so it's a big unlearning that we're doing as a people on the back of democracy that is starting off with us first reclaiming our names. And once we've reclaiming our, reclaimed our names, hopefully that then translates into reclaiming your identity and going back into this idea of being an integrated, integral oneness of person, right? And that doesn't happen often. And that's why the split that we often have in identity is a split that continues for every single space that we come in. We're far more lenient and open to the idea that this, the version of myself that left home is not the version of myself that comes in through the elevator or, or the office door. And that is not a struggle that typically white people will have to confront with because they are themselves everywhere they go. It's an important thing for us to think about. So when I got the opportunity to start applying for university, so I was in grade 11, and I had to apply, I, I fill in my university application forms, I remember just thinking, why am I still calling myself Bridget? The application form is asking me for my first name. My first name is the name my parents gave me when they first set eyes on me. And that name was not Bridget. And so I just decided that everything that I was going to fill in from there on was going to honor the name that my parents gave me at birth. That's what I did. So if you've read Roots or watched the movie, you probably resonate with the story quite a bit. And I've been very deliberate in the aftermath of that, of not using Bridget in any way or form in my life. Not because I hate my name. My father named me. Apparently there's a whole story that apparently he used to call me his bridge over troubled water. And that's absolutely fine. And it's very sweet. Um, but there's meaning behind the word Nozipo. And as we know, culturally, our names have meaning. They're, our names have purpose. Um, our names have our, the DNA of our destiny intertwined in them. And so to the extent that we can, we can reclaim those, I think we should. So that's my story. That's my story. And that's why I don't go by the name Bridget. But if you bump into me, please don't call me Bridget because so kaban. But I thought, let me, let me just, let me just share, um, you know, where that comes from. And of course, being called Nozipo comes with its issues. Typically, my clients are international clients all over the world. So they don't even call me Nozipo. If they see my full name, they want to call me Nozipo, which means mother of diseases. And so I have to keep reminding people that I'm not mother of diseases. I am multi-talented woman and that there's meaning behind the P and the H. Um, but that's not a, that's not a thing that I'm going to tire from doing because it's an invitation to tell people the story of my name every time they get it wrong. It doesn't upset me. What I do get upset about is people call me, calling me no sipo because you seeing a Z in which language is a Z and S guys? At what point does it do? Do you see no C instead of nosy? Anyway, story for another day. I'm over, I've gotten over being called no sipo now, but I prefer no zipo or nosy or nos, whatever, but no Bridget, no no sipo or any variation of those. So that's it. Mentorship Monday. I hope you had guys. Oh, I mustn't forget before you go, please two things. One, please let us know who you want to see on Mentorship Mondays. We're calling them our game changers. Please DM us so we can approach the people you want us to talk to um, so that we can engage with them and invite them to join us. I know you don't want to listen to my voice the whole year. So we'd love, love, love to do that. And please don't forget to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, on YouTube, it is Nozi Shabalala. And um, this is where we're going to be saving all the lives. Love you lots. Dila, thank you as well. Lasika, nice to see you. Take care and uh, have a good, good evening. Bye. Mwah. How do I start this thing again? <laughs>